Good morning, everybody. Saludos a todos. It's great to see you and be seen. Uh, Robert Carrillo here from the mighty Metro Vision Studios in uh, Los Angeles, California. And today's Monday, March 30th. And uh, we've got an exciting topic. We're still going with the uh, heroes of faith and faith over fear. And I'm excited because today we're doing the book of Esther. And if you've ever read the book of Esther, you know it's a fantastic story. It's incredibly inspiring. Uh, Esther was uh, uh, part of a refugee community in the city of Susa, which was the capital of the Persian Empire, in about the 6th century. And uh, somebody who really came from nothing to ending up saving her people, you know, and, and what a great story it is. And it's a woman's story, which I, which I love that. And so I know this amazing, beautiful, spiritual, incredibly insightful woman named Michelle Carrillo. Oh, she's my wife. And uh, she's going to come in here and uh, share with us just her perspective. She's going to tell us a little bit about the story and then just tell us some things that she thinks that will help us, and especially the women, uh, what we can get out of it. But I'm sure there's going to be a lot for all of us. So without further ado, I present to you my beautiful wife. Michel. Good morning, uh, friends and family, sisters uh, all over uh, the metro region, um, all over the United States. It's it's good to be here with you. Um, I I really want to express that. I have been praying for you. I love you. I'm um, thinking about you. And, um, you know, I, I am very grateful that we have close friends, that we have um, people we can count on, people to love and, and pass, you know, spend these days with um, virtually pretty much, but spend time with and talk with. Um, I wanted to, um, you know, I heard this uh, man say the other day that he heard someone say, well, we're all in the same boat now. And um, he said, well, actually, no, we're not in the same boat. We're in the same storm, but we all have our own boats. And I thought that was very insightful because it, uh, we definitely know we're all in a storm. Um, that life is not what it had been a month ago. Um, things are very challenging and, and scary. And, um, and not everybody is in the same position. You know, some people have their jobs and they're working like crazy, Do doctors and nurses and um, firemen and policemen and um, Starbucks employees. I mean, people are working. There's a lot of people out there. And then there's people who are inside and they're working from home. And there's people working at home with all their kids. And um, there's a lot of, you know, there, well, and then not to mention, um, we're worried about our, our health. Um, we're worried for our kids, our family, our husbands, our sisters, brothers, mothers. Um, you know, there's there's a lot going on, a lot that uh, we are going through at this time. And I, I thought it was a good idea to study Esther because um, here she is, this little Jewish girl who um, was basically held captive in another nation. And um, she is living her life and she's really nobody at this point. I mean, even though the Jewish people were very intelligent, and educated and wise, they were basically captives in this other nation. And, um, you know, so here she is, she's an orphan, her mom and dad died, she's being raised by her cousin Mordecai. And um, they hear that you know, there, there's a search for a queen, that, that the king is looking for a queen. And I, I want to just um, read some um, scriptures to kind of um, sum up what this story is about. Um, I know some of us have read this story, some of us have not, and so for, for me it had been a while, so it was good to read it again. But um, I'm going to start in Esther chapter 2. 
in verse two, it says, then the king's personal attendants proposed, let a search be made for beautiful young virgins for the king. Um, the latter part of verse three, let them be placed under the care of Haggai, the king's eunuch, who is in charge of the women, and let beauty treatments be given to them. Um, honestly, that sounds really great right now. Um, some of us didn't think of getting our hair colored right before. I mean, who would have known all this stuff would be happening? I know there's women who go to the nail salon and the tanning salon. And, you know, uh, I one of my uh, uh, aunts had posted that, you know, in about a week, we're going to see what color your hair really is, which I thought was pretty comical. Um, I think we're probably all wishing we had wigs. Um, probably the white women are thinking, what? <laughs> I haven't had a wig in, you know, since the 1960s. But anyway, it'd be great to have one now. Um, anyway, in, in uh, back to the story in verse 7, it says, This young woman, who was also known as Esther, had a lovely figure and was beautiful. Mordecai had taken her as his own daughter when her father and mother died. In verse 8, latter part, Esther also was taken to the king's palace and entrusted to Haggai, who had charge of the harem. She pleased him and won his favor. Immediately, he provided her with her beauty treatments and special food. He assigned to her seven female attendants selected from the king's palace and moved her and her attendants into the best place in the harem. Esther had not revealed her nationality and family background because Mordecai had forbidden her to do so. So here she is. She's Jewish. She's in the king's palace. She's being prepared to be presented to the king. Um, she, you know, which is sounds great, but she also knows she's Jewish and she they probably they wouldn't have picked her if she they had known she was Jewish. Um, so in verse 12, it says, before a young woman's term came, um, turn came to go to King Xerxes, she had to complete 12 months of beauty treatments prescribed for the women, six months with oil of myrrh and six with perfumes and cosmetics. Wow, that's a spa day for a whole year. Um, in verse 14, um, latter part, she would not return to the king unless he was pleased with her and summoned her by name. Then in verse 17, it says, Now the king was attracted to Esther more than to any of the other women, and she won his favor and approval more than any of the other virgins. So he set a royal crown on her head and made her queen instead of Ashti. And the king gave a great banquet, Esther's banquet, for all his nobles and officials. He proclaimed a holiday throughout the provinces and distributed gifts with royal liberty. Um, when the virgins were assembled a second time, Mordecai was sitting at the king's gate. But Esther had kept secret her family background and nationality, just as Mordecai had told her to do. Um, and she had continued to follow his instructions just as she done when she was growing up. Um, so you kind of get you get the picture that she's not just beautiful, she's alluring, she's enchanting, she's endearing. Um, she's humble and smart and um, that's a lot of gifts. So um, in uh, chapter three in verse one, it says, these events, King Xerxes honored, okay, um, I don't really want to read all this, but basically Haman, Haman who um, ends up being the one who uh, brings a charge to the king against the Jews, says that he is honored in the palace. And um, But there's a problem because it says that um, Mordecai, uh, Esther's cousin will not bow down to him and pay honor to him. Um, so in verse 3, it says, Then the royal officials at the king's gate asked Mordecai, Why do you disobey the king's command? Day after day they spoke to him, but he refused to comply. Therefore they told Haman about it to see whether Mordecai's behavior would be tolerated, for he had told them he was a Jew. When Haman saw that Mordecai would not kneel down or pay him honor, he was enraged. 
Yet having learned who Mordecai's people were, he scorned the idea of killing only Mordecai. Instead, Haman looked for a way to destroy all Mordecai's people, the Jews, throughout the whole kingdom of Xerxes. Wow, this is a lot of pride, a lot of ego that he is so insulted that he's not happy with just killing Mordecai. He wants to kill all his people, um, which is extremely intense and extremely arrogant. <clears throat> Um, in verse 8, it says, Then Haman said to King Xerxes, he, he's presenting himself to the king, There is a certain people dispersed among the peoples in all the provinces of your kingdom who keep themselves separate. Their customs are different from those of all the other people, and they do not obey the king's laws. It is not in the king's best interest to tolerate them. If it pleases the king, let a decree be issued to destroy them, and I will give 10,000 talents of silver to the king's administrators for the royal treasure. Whoa. So he presents this to the king, and then the king says in verse 11, Keep the money, the king said to Haman, and do with the people as you please. Um, I think it's pretty deceitful that he is acting like these people did this to the king when they did it to him, and that's what really infuriated him. Um, but in verse 15, at the end of the, the verse, it says, The king and Haman sat down to drink, but the city of Susa was bewildered. Um, so in verse 1 of chapter 4, it says, When Mordecai learned of all that had been done, he tore his clothes, put on sackcloth and ashes, and went out into the city wailing loudly and bitterly. In verse 4, when Esther's eunuchs and female attendants came and told her about Mordecai, she was in great distress. Verse 5, then Esther summoned Hathak, one of the king's eunuchs assigned to attend her, and ordered him to find out what was troubling Mordecai and why. So Hathak went to Mordecai in the open square of the city in front of the king's gate. Mordecai told him everything that happened. He also showed him the edict that the king had put out. Um, in verse 9, it says, Hathak went back and reported to Esther what Mordecai had said. Then she instructed him to say to Mordecai, Okay, this is Esther's first response, okay, her initial feelings about the situation. And she says, all the king's officials and the people of the royal provinces know that for any man or woman who approaches the king in the inner court without being summoned, the king has but one law, and that they be put to death unless the king extends the gold, or scep the gold scepter to them and spares their lives. But 30 days have passed since I was called to go to the king. So this is the, the message that is taken back to um, Mordecai. <clears throat> and then in verse 12, it says, When Esther's words were reported to Mordecai, he sent back this answer. Do not think that because you are in the king's house, you alone of all the Jews will escape. For if you remain silent at this time, relief and deliverance for the Jews will arise from another place. But you and your father's family will perish. And who knows but that you have come to your royal position for such a time as this. Then Esther sent this reply to Mordecai. Well, actually, let me just stop here for a second. Um... You know, I, I think um, this is a big call for Esther to go to the king. I mean, she's, she's risking her life. Um, she's putting her life in danger, and she's pretty comfortable right now not, you know, being known. Um, but Mordecai tells her, look, if you do this, uh, God will use someone else, but you're going to die. Um, and then he, he gives her the encouragement and he says, but 
You know, he says, and who knows, but that you have come to your royal position for such a time as this. Um, this is a scripture that my daughter has tattooed on her shoulder um, because it means a lot that we have have this, that God would consider us in his plan, that he would use us in his plan. And um, it, it, it was encouraging to Esther because in verse 15, it says, Then Esther sent this reply to Mordecai, Go gather together all the Jews who are in Susa and fast for me. Do not eat or drink for three days, night or day. I and my attendants will fast as you do. When this is done, I will go to the king, even though it is against the law. And if I perish, I perish. So Mordecai went away and carried out all of Esther's instructions. So from here, the you know all the Jews are fasting um, from food and water for three days. She is also, she comes up with the plan and um, basically saves her people. She goes to the king and appeals to him. Um, I wanted to, um, I have three points from this lesson. And um, one is that we all have gifts. We all have something to give. You know, Esther was beautiful. She was charming, endearing, smart. Uh, she... Uh, listened to advice. She was humble, um, moldable. She she would, had a lot of gifts to give, and and God used them. Um, but we all have something to give. We all were created in God's image. We were all um, designed with a special something. I mean, this morning when I was thinking about it, I thought we're kind of like a a banquet. You know, we have. Um, all different kinds of foods. Um, you know, I think of uh, Thanksgiving. Um, you know, you have the turkey, you have stuffing, mashed potatoes and gravy. I mean, I know some of us don't eat these things anymore, but, <laughs> you know, it's hard to imagine uh, Thanksgiving with one of those things um, because each flavor brings something different to the meal. It's, it brings something. You know, I think of a symphony and how each uh, instrument brings a sound, a, its own unique sound. And, and that's what we're like. We have our own gifts to give. Um, some of us speak well. Some of us work hard. Some of us are smart and organized and friendly and warm and you know, others of us are clear and focused and driven and determined. And um, some of us are good with children and animated and fun. And uh, we like to teach and we're wise. You know, some of us are wise. Some are doctors and nurses, police officers. You know, I think we have our different roles to play. I mean, I think um, sometimes we want to be everything and we never are. Um, but it holds us back from giving what we really are strong in. So that's one thing. Um, the second thing is we all have a purpose. We have a reason for being. Um, you know, sometimes, um, you know, we have the same response that Esther had. You know, it's like, who am I? What do I have? What, you know, how am I different than all the other men and women who, if they went before the king, they would be killed? Um I'm not special. I, I don't have a position. I don't have a plan. Um, sometimes that's our response. And yet God gave us something to contribute. Um, he gave us a purpose in it all. Um, even if I just think of my friends and how all my friends are so different from each other and yet have some special thing that they give, some, some you know, even sometimes their voice, even the way they talk or the way they see things. Um, you know, I think of one of my friends who it's just no matter what she says, she's she's so soft and sensitive and kind and loving. <laughs> Honestly, sometimes I don't even feel like a Christian when I'm around her. Um, but, you know, and then I have other friends who are very direct and powerful women who have done a lot of good things for other women. So we just have different gifts that have a purpose, um, you know, but Esther was beautiful. She was talented, 
um, it was all for a purpose. It was before she was born that God created her for this. Um, she spoke up, she stood up, and she took action. Um, the third thing is what we do matters. Um, you know, the first time, her first reaction, her inclination was fearful, um, but her decision was faithful. She decided faith. And um, what we do with what we have makes a difference. Um, it makes me think of the movie, It's a Wonderful Life, and how um, the Christmas movie, how the main character gets a, a look at how his life has made a difference in his small town. And yet it wasn't just his town. It, you know, it impacted his brother who ended up saving thousands of lives in war. And, you know, he didn't feel like his life was that big of a deal. He didn't feel like he was making a difference, but he was making a huge difference. Um, sometimes the things that we do seem small or ordinary. Um, but they make a difference. You know, I think of the book of Hebrews, um, the Faith Hall of Fame, um, you know, how in that list in Hebrews 11, it talks about people who are beheaded, who are tortured, who are sought into, all these like horrible things that nobody would want to happen. And within that list, there's Moses, his mother. And she's in the list because she put Moses in a basket and set him on the river, which in one way seems like no small thing. On the other hand, I can't imagine doing that with any of my kids. Um, how incredibly faithful for her to do that. Um, but, you know, she probably didn't know. She, of course, she didn't know that her small little act of faith was going to make such a huge difference for the world. Um, and, and really, we don't know her for anything else except this, that she was Moses' mother and she put him in a basket and sent him down the river. Um, so, you know, who knows, but that we're here now for such a time as this. Um, to give our gifts, to um, love our people, to speak the truth and love, uh, serve others, pray, fast, help. But um, I do want to challenge us all to choose faith and not fear. May God bless you.